Um, if you're just joining us, we've been going through uh, different messages uh, about prayer, looking at scripture, and seeing different aspects of our prayer life and the importance and the priority of prayer. And so Psalm 66 leads us to another topic today, um, kind of opposite of where last week's topic was. Last week's topic, if you were not with us, was on uh, listening more than we talk in our prayer life. And how do we actually listen more instead of talk so much in our conversation with God? And we looked at passages that talked about that the, what helps us listen to God is based on our meditation of God's Word. When we not just read God's Word, and it's an awesome thing if you're intentionally taking the opportunity to read God's Word on your own, I want to challenge you not just to read it and be content with read it, but soak it up and own it for your life. Don't just read it and say, oh, I've read a verse, but what does this verse mean to my life? What can it be applicable in my life? Own it. Meditation of God's Word is taking all the ingredients to the bread, putting it in the oven, and letting that, be- that bread bake until we can eat it. And meditation on God's Word is when we start smelling that, that smell of that bread coming out of that oven is is that we're taking the opportunity for God's Word to mold us and say, Lord, how does this apply to my life? And when we do that, and we own that Scripture, and we get quiet before God, and we're saying, Lord, speak to me, it'll be through God's Word that He speaks to us. It'll be through those meditations upon the Word of God, that feasting upon the Word of God, that reminds you and gives you direction to say this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me because it's being affirmed by the Word of God. That doesn't happen unless we meditate on the Word of God and we actually don't just know it, but we own it in our life. And last week, the goal was to let God talk more in our prayer life instead of us talking so much. Today, though, we want to talk about when we do get the chance to speak, How do we know that God hears our prayers? It's a very basic, very important question, right? How do we know that when we talk back to God, He's hearing my prayers? And that in mind, let's let's stand in in honor of the reading of the Word of God in, in Psalm 66, verses 16 through 20, is what we'll read. And then we'll pray and we'll begin to walk through this passage together. Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell what He has done for me. I cried out to Him with my mouth, and praise was on my tongue. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away my prayer or turned His faithful love from me. Let's pray. Jesus, as we go in this time of teaching, God, even now, God, if there's anything you want to reveal to my heart, Lord, as I study this, God, that you do that and that I won't allow anything to in my flesh, Lord, to hinder your spirit working through me and teaching me. And God, I pray for these people, Lord, that that, God, we will be like this psalmist, that we will have the confidence to say, the Lord has listened to my prayer, and that we'll understand what it is that you do listen to and what you hear, and, Lord, what you choose not to hear. And so, God, may we walk out of here closer in our walk with you and our prayer life with you because we understand better from your word what it is that you want to hear when we can respond back. Jesus, help us now, we pray. Amen. Verse 18 and 19, this psalmist gives us that there's a clear divide of people that pray. There are some people that God hears their prayers, and there are some people that God doesn't hear their prayers. Look back at verse 18. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. Now, I believe the word of God is true. There's not one part of it that is not correct or inspired by God's presence and spirit. 
I believe it's all true. And I believe if this guy didn't know what he was talking about, God would not have permitted it in the Bible. Okay? He knows what he's talking about. He has experienced God, and it's by the leadership of the power of the Holy Spirit that he is writing these truths to us. And so, church, we should take heed because this guy's saying that there is the possibility of two types of people when they talk back to God, those that he hears and those that he doesn't. So we're going to focus today on what God hears and what God chooses not to hear. So I'd like to go ahead and get the bad out of the way. How about y'all? Let's go ahead and talk about what he doesn't hear so that we can get to the good stuff, okay? Verse 18, if I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. This is not the only isolated verse that talks about the condition of our heart and whether or not God hears us or not. There's other verses that I want to point them out to you. Proverbs 15, 28. You can write this down if you'd like. Proverbs 15, 28. Let's look at it. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable to the Lord. Thank you, 15, 8, not 28. Thank you, Eric. You listened last, last service. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Two types of people, both coming into a worship service. God's saying, there's one that I find detestable, and there's one that I find righteous and listen. The wicked, detestable. The upright, he delights in it. Let's go to the next verse, Proverbs 28. Anyone who turns his ear away from the hearing of the law, even his prayer is detestable. In the context... God's people at this time, the Jewish people, were called to obey the law and walk according to the law. And if they said, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to go against the law, God would find their prayers detestable. Isaiah chapter 1. God referring to his people. Isaiah chapter 1. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers... I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. God's saying, I'm not even listening to you because you're involved with wickedness, with bloodshed, with war. It's not just in the Old Testament that we see God talking about this. We see it also, 1 Peter 3, verse 12. Peter refers back to Psalms 34 and says this, For the one who wants to love life And to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Verse 11. And he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those that do what is evil. James chapter 4 verse 8. Let's look at James 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Verse 9. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He's talking to his church. He actually, in the verses earlier, says, you adulterous people. You, let's go ahead and go back to verse 3 there so they can see that. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your desires for pleasure. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about a prayer life. He's saying you ask but you don't receive because of your false motives, your selfish motives. Adulterous. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Verse 5. Or do you think it is without reason the scripture says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealousy? Verse 6. But he gives greater grace. Therefore he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Okay? Scripture is all through the Bible that there are two types of people that could pray to God 
And God is saying, I'm going to hear this person, but I'm not going to hear that person. Now let's go back to Psalm 66, verse 18. Look at this. Psalm 66, verse 18. This is the psalmist. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Understand what he's saying there. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. All through Scripture, we see a theme of who God listens to and who God does not. Who is He not listening to? Those that are in intentional, willful disobedience and wickedness. That they don't pursue righteousness, they pursue what is evil. Even the psalmist says, if I was aware of some malice, which is evil intent towards someone, or evil intent to do something, sin, that God wouldn't hear my prayer. So there's two truths I want you to write down today about who God doesn't listen to. Number one, God does not listen to prayers outside of a relationship with Jesus. It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, we just looked at passages that says, God says, because of your wickedness, because of your unrighteousness, I will not listen to your prayers. Church, who makes us righteous before God? Church, who makes us righteous before God? Your works? Jesus. My righteousness is but filthy rags before a holy God. It is only His righteousness that gives me the confidence to approach God because I am covered in His righteousness. I am wicked without the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ covering my sins and the Holy Spirit that He put into my heart to be obedient allows me to pursue righteousness. Without Jesus, I don't have a chance unrighteous without Jesus. And if the scripture clearly says God doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked and the unrighteous, those who are not covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, their prayers are not heard by God. That is so weird to a culture that believes that every path brings you to God in some capacity, in some way. But my friends, we have not been called to be experts of culture. We have been called to be students of the Word of God. Amen. And the Word of God teaches you that there is no access to God on your own work or effort. Your only chance is through Christ Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God does not hear your prayers outside of a relationship with Jesus. That's why it is futile for us to ever join in a cross-religion demonstration of events where we're all going to come together and pray together. This religion, this religion and Christianity because folks, we're not praying to the same person. So why Franklin Graham, back in 2001, where there was this political campaign to make everyone seem as nice and all religions leading to the same God, this is why Franklin Graham said, let this be known, the God of Christianity is not the God of the Muslims. Amen. The Word of God, which is perfect, which is truth, and which only truth is found in God's Word. Church, do you believe that? Now, truth can be applied within our life, but truth is going to come from the Word of God. You have the right to be as open-minded as Genesis to Revelation will allow you to be, but outside of the Bible, there is no other truth. Amen. It's here. And God only hears the prayers of those that are in right relationship with Him, and that cannot happen without you surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as Him as Lord of your life. Mom and Daddy can't intercede for you. Children, you need to understand this. 
Teenagers, you need to know this. You may have a very godly mom and daddy that have taught you about Jesus. But you still stand in opposition to God until you have surrendered to His Lordship in your life. Mom and daddy can't do that for you. You've got to make that decision to surrender your life to Christ. And you may say, well, Chris, isn't that the exception? How can a lost man get saved if God doesn't hear his prayer? We'll get to that at the end of the service with Scripture. So wait, wait till then. I'm going to keep you around till then, okay, to answer that question. Because there is an answer to it. Number two, though, that's not the only person that God doesn't hear their prayer. First person, God does not hear the prayer of the one outside of relationship with Jesus Christ. But number two, what did the psalmist say? If I was aware of malice in my heart, God would not have listened to my prayer. What is the other person that God does not listen to? Number two, God does not listen to Christian's heart that is living in intentional, willful sin. Now folks... If you're saved, you're not done with the sin problem in your life. Now, you have victory over it. The jail cell has come wide open, and you're free, and you are free from the power. You're no longer slave to it. But we still have the taste of it in our life until we hit glory. Until we get to heaven, that taste for sin will not leave our life. But it is not that it has power over you. You just sung about this. There's no power over you now because of Christ. But Christ's power. But there is the ability, because we're still dealing with a fleshly nature, to go back to that taste and willfully, intentionally sin. Now, folks, there are some sins we call, you know, that we don't even have control over. Like you're singing a song and an evil thought comes into your mind. You didn't want that thought there. It just comes. That's just your sin. That's still the flesh in you. That's still, in my situation, that's just still Chris Roberts living here. But praise God, at six years old, someone else came to camp out in my life. And his name was Jesus. And I have another voice screaming in my life saying, don't choose that. But till I hit glory in heaven, I'm not going to be rid of Chris. Okay? And there are moments that I can willfully do what Jonah did. That I can willfully do what Peter did. And that I hear what I'm supposed to do, but in my fleshly nature, I get my focus off the Lord, quit relying upon the power of His Spirit to help me walk away from self, and I fall right back to self. And what is that? That is willful, intentional sin. And God does not listen to the prayer of the individual that has willful, intentional sin in their life, even if they're a believer. I'll share this illustration. You've heard it before. If you've been with us five years, you've probably heard it five times now. Chris, why do you keep sharing the same stories? You run out of them? No. I want you to have something to disciple other people with, okay? And repetition's key. And so until I get sick and tired of talking about it, you're not getting it yet, Okay? Or so they say. I'm not sick of it yet. Still a good analogy, illustration. What are we talking about this relationship with God, but yet God stops us the conversation in the track and says, we're not going any further until we fess up with this. What are we talking about? Well, imagine you got this beautiful 2015 Mustang. If you're not a Mustang guy, Chevrolet guy, it's your other one. Okay, whatever you call it. Just get your car in your mind. Okay, you got it? Imagine that you're all teenagers right now and mom and daddy see that you're a high school student now and they're like, okay, they can actually stay at home by themselves and we can go out of town for the night and we'll come back the next evening. Grandparents can keep in touch with them, make sure they're okay, but we're going to let them kind of have a night together because they are resourceful, because they have been obedient so far that they have no reason not to trust them. So they trust them. And mom and dad go off for a special Friday night weekend, not coming back till Saturday night. Daddy tells son or daughter, 
You can drive the clunker. And you know what the clunker is, right? The car with only th with one hubcap instead of four. Okay? You can drive that around. It's got dents on it, so it, it's proven that it can handle pain. You can drive that around town if you need to get somewhere. Don't touch the Mustang. Now, where's the Mustang, folks? You know where it is. It's in the shed with a cover on it. Right? Daddy takes it off when he wants to polish it again or take it for a ride. But then he puts it in that shed and has a cover on it. Well, here's the deal. You're okay with the clunker until your buddies come around and say, man, let's go have a good time tonight. We'll even be home at your bedtime that you're supposed to be, 11 o'clock. And that's plenty enough, parents, by the way, for your teenagers. Okay? We'll be at home at 11 o'clock, but let's take your dad's ride. And man, you, you know you're not supposed to. You know you wouldn't get this far as them trusting you if you hadn't been obedient so far. But man, there's this pretty girl amongst that group. You haven't been able to impress her yet, but maybe this might be how you do it. And so what do you do? You take the car out. And guess what? You have a good time. You have good, clean fun the whole night. Nothing's happened. You even go 10 miles below the speed limit. You drop everyone off and you are grinning from ear to ear because there has been no consequence yet. And you come around the curb and because you couldn't see the deer in the tree climber that day, it decided it would come out and meet you that evening and it hits your Mustang. And it puts a nice dent in it. And mom and daddy are coming home Saturday. Here's what's going on in your life. You don't want to be around when mom and daddy comes home. Because you know daddy's going to go check the shed to see how the car is. Now when dad goes and checks that car, listen folks. What's the conversation that he wants to have when he walks in the door? It's not, mom and dad, tell me about your weekend. It's not, hey mom and dad, what do y'all want to do tomorrow with me? They want to address the issue at hand. And there's not going to be any conversation about anything else until it's addressed. There's not even going to be entertainment of other talk until that's addressed. Why is it any different in your relationship with Jesus Christ? It's not. And Christian, when you live in intentional, willful sin, you're going to want to have other conversations. But God is saying, no, 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 no. You can't hide anything from me. I know it. And I am not going to hang out in fellowship with you about anything else until we address this issue. And so that's when the conversations cease, folks. You understand? That's why there's a commandment and an encouragement in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Look at it on the screen. Of what Christians are to do when they sin. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why does He want to be faithful in doing that? Because God can't talk to us with sin in between. His grace is sufficient for the moments that just naturally come out that you don't mean, but what He wants to do is He wants you to recognize and confess that which you know and you own and you did because you wanted to in defiance. He's saying, we got to clear this up because we can't move forward until we do. Now, church, He's faithful if we will come to Him to do just that. Just like your mom and dad, they're not going to kick you out of the family, but there's going to be a great tension until y'all resolve this issue and have this conversation. And that's why many of us, when we're falling away from God, we want to escape the moments with God. That's why we don't want to be around God's people. That's why we want to come up with excuses why we can't do this or do that with God's people because mom and daddy are coming home and we don't want to be in the house. You understand? But you're not going to feel right and you're going to be restless until you have that conversation. Every one of you have had that moment before. You've messed up royally and you know how it feels. No matter how much the consequence or the punishment is afterwards, you're glad when the conversation's over, right? Church. I 
I'm fearful that the reason sin seems like it's reigning in our country it's not because it's the lost man's fault. The lost are going to do what the lost do. But there's no prayers of power or impact from his church impacting the culture because God's not wanting to talk to you about other lost people right now. He's wanting to talk about the sin in your life. You know, this church has been an amazing thing these last five years. People told me six years ago, this is what you're going to experience six years later. You're going to experience this, 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 and this. I would have told you yes. And I would have had a different people group in mind. I would have thought about all the people that were not connected to church, that were lost and disconnected because those are the people that had those issues. Never did I realize that what God was humbling me with is like, no, Chris, there's the issues in the church first. And i got to deal with the church first before they can be salt because they're not being salt right now. They're being like I said they would be when they lose their saltiness. They're no earthly good right now because they're just being trampled upon because their hearts are not with me. They're not having conversation. They're faking it. They're telling me, well, yes, Jesus, I love you, but they've intentionally walked this way, and yet they won't talk to me about it, and they think I don't know. So I'm going to remove my presence and power in their life and I'm going to let sin reign. It's not the lost world's fault. The lost world is the way it is. We're the salt and light of the earth. No, we're not Jesus, but Jesus empowered us to be his hands and feet. And folks, until we get right with God in confession, he's not listening to anything else. Because there's no other conversation he wants to have. But his people getting right. What did he tell Solomon when we would lose our way in the fallen era? If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and repent, would ask for forgiveness. Not if the pagan would do that. If my people. So what is the first prayer that God hears? It's got to start with confession, folks. And that James chapter 4, that's a prophetic word. There's a not enough weeping and mourning in the church anymore. There's a bunch of laughing and singing, but there's not a bunch of weeping and mourning. Have we been broken about our sinful life? Or are we willing to talk to our Father and say, Daddy, I, I, you know what it is we need to talk about, and I'm sorry that I've been waiting around, so let's talk about this. He's not going to kick you out of the family, folks. In fact, better days are to come once you let him address it. Will you do that? Okay. You ready to get to the good stuff? All right, let's do that. Psalm 66, verse 19. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. If this man's walking with God because he wouldn't be in the Bible if he was he wouldn't be a writer of one of these chapters if he was not, because God's word is true, when he has confidence that God's listening to his prayers, this is a guy that I want to kind of rub shoulders with. You understand? This is a guy that I want to listen. Okay, if God's listening to your prayers, what is it about your prayers that he's listening, that you have confidence? Well, guys, guess what? We don't even have to go out of Psalm 66 to understand that. He's expressing it by his lifestyle and what he's saying. Let's look at it, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 66. What are the prayers that God hears? Number one, it's the confession of our heart. But let's look at verses 1 through 4. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you. Because of your great strength, all the earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. What is this psalmist doing? He's saying, I want to talk to you about how awesome God is. Here's how awesome God is. That everybody, even the enemies, are going to worship him one day. That's confirmed by Paul in Ephesians when he says, every knee will bow, not Ephesians, Philippians, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. He says that. 
This is how awesome you are, God. That everyone is going to declare your works and your honor and your glory. It's awesome. And I had a chance to watch some football yesterday. And there was a guy about three times larger than me. With his shirt off at the game. There might have been some factors that contributed to that. But this guy was large. And he was confident. He had a big R on his, sh- on his chest. And he was excited. Let me tell you about this guy. He would have never walked in this environment with a shirt off, but he was excited about the environment he was in. And folks, his team was winning, and this guy was jumping. I mean, there were points we couldn't see his head. You got me? He was excited. No restraint. Excited. Freed up. Why? Because he was so overwhelmed by the object of his affection. His team was winning. They were not supposed to win yesterday, but they won by two, almost two touchdowns. And he was ecstatic. And he was going crazy because he was so caught up in the object of his affection. He didn't care who was around. He thought it was awesome. And man, was he worshiping the object of his affection. And his object of his affection for the necessity of his lives, his life, has never given him one thing. He's never given him money to pay his rent. He's never given him the food that he eats. He's never even talked to the guy. But he is so intense about the object of this affection that he is just going crazy. Psalmist has got it right. The object of his affection is not some petty ball game that he doesn't know if they're going to win this week or not and let them down. The object of his affection is the one that created all of life. And how intense is he about it? He didn't say whisper, he said shout. He didn't say let others sing like the choir, you sing. He even said how strong he was going to be. He was having a conniption fit about the awesomeness and the glory of his one true God. Number one, what is the prayer? Outside of confession, when we have confessed to get our hearts right with God, there are three things that God listens to. What is the first thing that God listens to according to this scripture, according to this model of this psalm, this verses 1 through 4? God hears the heart that is full of praise for his great name. God listens to the prayers that brag about him. God hears the prayers of a heart full of praise. Praising God means to brag about who he is. Nowhere in verses 1 through 4 has he said anything personal about what God's done for him. He is just ascribing and saying, declaring, this is who God is. Folks, God didn't have to do one more thing in your life for him to deserve eternal worship for you the rest of your life. He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your honor. When you see him physically for the first time, it's going to take your breath away probably. God wants to hear the praises of his people. When is the last time in your prayer life you brag to God about who he is? Not what he's done for you. You've just bragged about who he is. God, you're awesome. You're so awesome that one day everyone's going to know how awesome you are. You're not going to let it escape anybody. There's no one coming after you. There's no one been before you. You're awesome, God. Church, God hears the prayers of his people that brag upon him and how awesome he is. When's the last time you told God and bragged upon him to his face? When's the last time you paid him a compliment? When's the last time you declared you're awesome? You want to know how well God hears? Scripture's telling us. We got a God. We have an example. This psalmist. 
verses 1 through 4. He can't even get over who God is. I haven't even talked about what he's done for him, but who God is. That's the prayers that God hears. Church, are we bragging upon God? Verses 5 through 12 tell us another thing that God listens to. Let's look at it. Verses 5, come and see the works of God, his act towards mankind are all inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot. There, were, there we rejoiced in him. He rules over by his might. He keeps his eyes on the nations. The rebellious should not exalt themselves. Praise our God, you peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He keeps us alive and does not allow our feet, feet to slip. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our back. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. He's now went from general to personal. In his verses of verses 5 through 12, he's now turned it of what God has done for him. Look at what he's done for his people. Verse 8. Praise our God, you peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Verse 9, he keeps us alive and does not allow our feet to slip. He's now making ownership of what God has done in his life. And he doesn't just talk about the times that God rescued him and kept him from danger. Give verses 10 through 12. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You, that's God, lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. You let men ride out over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. He's even thanking God for the adversity that he's brought in his life because it's made him stronger. So number two, what is the second type of prayer that God hears? God hears a grateful heart. A heart that's grateful and thankful even in the tough times. God hears the prayers of a grateful heart for the good and the tough times. Church, thank God for his goodness to you even in the hard times. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, blessed be your name. That's Job talking. None of you have had a day like Job. Okay, And Job is choosing to still have a grateful heart and say thank you. When's the last time you thank God? When's the last time you talk to God and in your conversation, when you talk back, it was thank you? But let me challenge you a little deeper. When's the last time that most difficult moment in your life where you feel like he put you in a trap, you feel like he lured you in, you feel like he let somebody run over your head, he refined the mess out of you. When's the last time you thanked him for that? Because it was in those moments that you saw how sufficient his grace was in your weakness. It was in those moments when he let you get that weak that you didn't even have the temptation to lean on yourself because you didn't have nothing in you. And he put you through the gamut simply so that you would know that his grace is sufficient in your weakness. When's the last time you thanked him for that? Follow me, church. God hears the prayer of a confessed heart. God hears the prayer of a heart full of praise. God hears the prayer of a grateful heart, even in the tough times. Last but not least, verses 13 through 15. I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I will offer you fattened sheep as burnt offerings with the fragrant smoke of rams. I will sacrifice oxen with goats. This is in the context 
of a God-fearing Jew who was walking right with God, this is how they expressed worship in their time. This was in the temple where they would bring burnt offerings, cattle, the best of the best, and they would offer it to God. And these burnt offerings were a symbolic sign that, God, I am committing with resolve in my heart to walk in your ways and be obedient to your ways. That's what this is saying. This guy is not just saying, God, I praise you for how awesome you are. I thank you for what you've done. Now, Lord, I want to tell you, I am committing to walk with you. I am committing to ultimately sacrifice the best that I have in order to follow you and your glory because you are what I want. You are what I desire. Last but not least, what is the prayer that God hears? God hears the prayer of the heart that is walking in obedience with Him. God hears the prayers of a heart that is devoted, devoted to living a life of obedience. Folks, we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. But is there a devotion in your life to submit to the authority of God where He is number one and you're saying, whatever you got to do, I give you the best of me. I offer the best of me with my vows. Do whatever it takes so that you can have all of me, all of my heart, all of who I am because you are truth. And there is no other. And I refuse to walk in a lie one more day. I want you and that will be my pursuit. That will be my goal. Not a championship, not a career move, not a raise. You will be my goal to walk in obedience to you. That's the prayer he hears. So folks, he doesn't hear the lost man. He doesn't hear the Christian in willful, intentional sin. He hears the repentant heart. That's a heart of confession. He hears a heart full of praise for His glory and they want to brag about Him. He hears a heart that is grateful for who He is and what He's done in their life. And He hears a heart that has devoted their life to being obedient to Him. All in Psalm 66 laden in Scripture all through, all through the Word of God. But it's there. Well, Chris, what about the verses where it says, if you ask upon Him in His name, anything you ask in His name, it will be granted to you. How does your, what you're saying in Psalm 66 apply? Let's think about that. Ask anything in my name, it will be granted to you. Number one, if it's in His name, it's for whose glory? His. If it's in His name, that means you're in relationship with Him, Right? So relationship with Him? You're praying for only Him to be bragged about, not you? When He comes through, what do we think? We're thankful for His promise that He is faithful. So there's a heart of grateful heart for His character and that we can trust in Him because we have seen His provision in our life already that we don't doubt it. We have a grateful heart and who He is. Not the circumstances, but in the character of God. We have a grateful heart. And then he hears and answers that prayer because he knows he's dealing with a heart that is saying, whatever I hand back to them, they're going to pursue it with all their heart because they're devoted to me in obedience. The glory of God with a grateful heart, willing to do whatever he tells them to do. So he does answer those type of prayers when it's for that purpose. Well, Chris, answer the question, does he hear the lost man? Don't go outside the context of Psalm 66 and it answers for you. A man gets saved. What happens in his life at that moment? He realizes there's no one greater than God. And he has been impacted by the glory of God. He has been convicted by the sin in his life. And that he is completely undone by his sinfulness. And he wants to be right with God. He trusts in the character of who God is when he says, I have already paid the penalty for sin of mankind by my son's sacrifice on the cross. And with a grateful heart, he thanks Jesus that he can trust in what Christ did for him on the cross. 
And he trusts that Christ was raised from the dead to prove he was God. And with a grateful heart, he trusts in what God says. But last but certainly not least, those who confess me as Lord because they believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead shall be saved. That person repents by turning from self and surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ saying, I want my life to be devoted to following you. My personal understanding of God's salvation, according to the scripture, it is an instantaneous act. That when I turn from self, it's like me throwing a quarter at you. When you grab it, you grab both sides of that coin at the same time. When I turn from self, I turn to something, and it was Jesus Christ. So, friends, in my personal conviction, by the study of the Word of God, when the Holy Spirit pricks that man's heart of his sin, the moment he begins to respond back to God is the moment that salvation begins to arise in his life. So God doesn't hear the prayers of a lost man. God hears the prayers of those who are responding to the gospel message and His grace that gives salvation. Why? Because God speaks first. And that unregenerated heart, by the power of His Spirit, hears and responds back for His glory, resting in His gratefulness and what God's done, and turning from self to be obedient to the Lordship of Christ. That may be you today, and that's all you've got to do now is respond back to God in that manner, and he will hear that prayer. It's not a magic prayer. It's not something called a sinner's prayer. It's not the ABCs of faith. It is conviction by the Holy Spirit that you are not right with God and that for the glory of God, he has revealed this in your life, and you believe he's no other now and you trust in the gospel message of Jesus and what he's done, and you're thankful for it, that you trust in it. And therefore, you willingly lay down your life to follow his life. Lordship of Christ. That can be yours, and that's the prayer that God will hear. Church, your application today is this. When's the last time you bragged to God to his face? When's the last time you thanked him? But think real hard about that. When's the last time you thanked him for the hard things? When's the last time your pursuit was not in what you got, but was the pursuit of just being obedient to following him? And if anything that's disrupted, your daddy wants to have a conversation with you. And he wants to go back to the moment in which you walked away. And he's faithful to forgive you. But he's stern and he's disciplined about we're not moving forward until we take care of this. Are you ready to confess that before him? Only then will God start doing a work. And only then will we start having a conversation again with the Almighty. Let's pray. Lord, we close now. We thank you for your word that gives clarity and steps. I ask Jesus that for the believers in this room that you reveal any malice or sin in our heart, God, that would prevent you from having dialogue with us. And God, may we bring that and confess that before you, Lord Jesus. And after that, God, may we begin to brag about who you are. May we be grateful for even the tough times. And God, may our heart cry and our passion of our life is to be obedient to the one who is worthy to follow. The only one worthy to spend time on. The only one worth dying for. The only one worth living for. 
God, may that be our pursuit. May you have our hearts today, Lord Jesus. For the lost man, will you convict his heart? Will he cry out in salvation for your salvation, Lord Jesus? We ask this and we trust you with it. Amen.